and hopefully it's told you that I'm recording. Yes, it has. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, got that. Right. Today, I'm going to start that again. Right. Today, I'm really pleased to welcome Jude Jennison to the show. Jude is an executive team coach, author, speaker, specializing in leading disruptive change. A business owner since 2010, Jude previously worked for IBM for 17 years, where she managed budgets of one billion and led UK, European and global teams. Jude develops leaders, executive teams and entrepreneurs to accelerate their businesses uh, business results through greater clarity, connection and commitment. She uncovers clients' default patterns of behavior by working with a herd of horses who respond to your nonverbal communications. Frequently described as courageous and inspirational, she overcame her fear of horses and transformed that fear into her business working with horses to develop leaders and teams. Jude, thank you uh, for coming on the show and welcome. Thanks, Nigel. Tell, obviously, this is going to be a fascinating conversation. Um, do you want to just tell the listeners a little bit more about you and, and uh, kind of a little bit more um, where you are and things like that? Yeah, so I'm based in, uh, well, currently based in Warwickshire, UK, uh, about to move to Staffordshire. I uh, spent the early part of my career, the first 17 years working for IBM and did a whole range of leadership roles um really specializing in not very much not knowing anything <laughs> and very quickly realized that if I didn't want to go down a technical path then I needed to be able to either manage clients or manage teams of people to do the stuff that I couldn't do yeah and uh, and I think that's what we call leadership now but in those days it was called management and so I um, I think I had about 17 jobs in 17 years and about as many managers. But really wow. every single job I had, had no job description. And it was more a case of, here's something over here that needs something doing, but we don't know what it needs doing. And um, so always about leading through uncertainty and leading change. And for me, one of the, one of the benefits about leading through uncertainty and leading change is, if it's never been done before, you can't really fail. <laughs> because if it's never been done before, then nobody knows how to do it. No, and so, true. so I, I became really adept at being able to look at something and, and, see, and see if there was a way through it and out the other side. And then to build a team. And so to have a vision, to build a team and then work with the team and lead the team to execute that vision and largely because I didn't I wasn't technical I didn't have the technical capabilities so I had to lead other people to do to do the things that I couldn't do and that's really how I developed my career over 17 years I then trained as a as a coach and I coached people in IBM alongside my, my day job for a number of years until I left in 2010 to set up my own leadership and coaching business and at the time I was terrified of horses and I thought I'll overcome my fear of horses and, um, and that, that will be it. And in the process, I learned so much about my leadership that I trained in the work that I now do, which has many names, but I call it equine facilitated leadership, um, which is one of its formal names, which is a way of working with horses on the ground. So there's no riding involved, but it involves working alongside horses on the ground to get them to engage, to come with you um, through free will. So without being coerced, without being forced, um, looking at how do you build rapport? How do you build the relationship based on trust and respect and invite them to come with you to achieve whatever you decide you want to achieve? Um, wow. Which of course is what project managers do all of the time. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny, I, I, I read a, um... A, just a brief bit and a post on, on LinkedIn uh, this evening. And, and I saw it said something along the lines of um, the fact that most project managers, you have no, um, uh, what's the name, authority. Mm -hmm. You just have influence. Yeah. 
Uh, yes. There are some situations where you have organizations are set up where you get the team and you manage the team and you own the whole team. But actually, most PMs are in that situation. There's kind of matrix organizations and we're mm -hmm. trying to drag, um, not drag, that's probably to persuade people to come along with the vision that you've been given by a sponsor uh, uh, to make it real. And yeah. I can see I can see the the correlation. Mm. Abs absolutely. And I think, you know, never never more than than today has that been relevant because if you look at what's happening with the volume of people who are leaving their jobs you know every company yeah. i'm working with at the moment their biggest issue is employee turnover and retaining the staff that they've got um yeah. and and therefore having to recruit because they've got high turnover and and that's because people have felt that they haven't had free will they haven't had a choice and now they are they are choosing to leave their organizations because the working conditions don't work for them. And, and I think, as you say, project managers have been persuading people to come with them without authority for, for decades. And, um, and when you work with a horse, you really get a sense of there absolutely is total free will from the horse. You can't make an 800 kilogram horse do anything it doesn't want to do. No. No, I can understand that, and it and it, I suppose it's that that old story of the the carrot and the stick scenario, isn't it? Is that it, it does in real terms with with a horse? If you're trying to force it with through sheer willpower, you're always at some point in danger, physical danger, aren't you? That that it you will they, they will wait for the opportunity for that backlash. Yeah, and you see, I mean, you see some horrendous um, videos and, and things on social media where, where horses have kicked out at people and yeah. you think, wow, what, you know, what, what has led to that situation? And actually, if you think again in the workplace where people lash out, uh, it, it's never over one thing. It's no. over a combination of many, many situations where suddenly people go, I've had enough, that, I'm done. Um, yeah. I'm either leaving or I'm going to completely rant and rave at you. <laughs> and, um, and, and it's the same with horses. It's, exa it's exactly the same, but they're less polite than people. So I think <laughs> what happens with people in the workplace is they, to a point, they will put up and shut up or, or they'll argue, but then still put up and shut up. Um, whereas the horses are either engaging or they're not. And it's very clear when they're not. Yeah, because they plant their feet, close their eyes, or they'll headbutt you. But either way, they they won't engage if they don't want to. Yeah, I can get that, and it it kind of um, it makes you think about the 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 sort of a lot of the education that you see about um, sort of micro activities that people do. And as you say, it's a, a boss can a, a good boss or a bad boss can either lift you up or wear you down through all the. The minor things they do it's not about the big things they do mm. typically whilst you do get that that's the kind of thing that would make press would make news would make tribunals and things like that but the micro activities are the ones that make people go sod that i've had enough now i'm going yeah but they won't do yeah. they wouldn't have done anything may not have even mentioned anything before that and just mm. step away from it and that's the thing isn't it it's the it, it's it's lots of questions popping in my head here. I'm thinking with two things that are probably affecting that market is obviously the pandemic um, has made a lot of us reevaluate and think about what work life means to us. The change back from the remote with, with people who were fortunate, unfortunate, however you want to just think of it, to continue working during the pandemic. Uh I've got into a situation where they've potentially found I'm, I'm one of these. I like working at home. I'm quite comfortable with it. I don't, I like people. I like working with people, but I can actually operate from home comfortably as well. Mm -hmm. And, but some people are being persuaded or indeed, uh, what's the word? Um, what's it? Oh, I've forgotten it now. I don't know, but certain members of the government writing their notes and leaving them on people's desks to suggest that they come in. Um, mm -hmm. It, that's that kind of thing is going to make people go actually do i really want to be doing that do i want to be traveling do i want to be there mm. and and changing it and the other thing i think is and, and i wonder if you agree with it and what you've seen is from a generational point of view 
the um, me coming from in the 80s when I started working, it's kind of expected. It was the default to go to an office. Mm. Some of the younger generation coming into there now is, but, but because, and partly because going into the office was the only way to do it. Yeah. Now, even before the pandemic, the tooling was there to go, mm. do we really need to be there? The mindset wasn't, but the tooling was was pretty much mm. there and it maybe it needed mm. some tweaking. But now that, and you think about it, you've got, I know um, nephews and nieces of mine who would have sat there watching a movie with their boyfriend and girlfriend on uh, FaceTime. And they're, they're sit, sitting there with the two of them. One's at home, one home, one at the other, watching the TV together. And it's kind of yeah. like, I just sat there thinking, I'm thinking, I couldn't imagine doing that, but that's because that wasn't available to me. And and I think that when you think about what we're doing now with with mm. um, uh, hybrid working, it's the same thing, but it comes naturally to a, a jet, the, jet, the latest generation that are moving into the workplace. And so they're more likely to question, why do I need to be there? when I can be anywhere and be nomadic or be just based at home or whatever. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I think there's a, there's a real tension here and I think it's going to go on for some time around what, what, what works, what actually works in terms of hybrid working, remote working, who needs to be in the office? When do you need to be in the office? How do you collaborate? Um, I was talking to one, one client recently and he said, Actually, when we're working on a, an Excel spreadsheet, it's easier to collaborate online than it is to do it face to face, because online you can share your spreadsheet and you can do it on Google Sheets and you can all be updating it at the same time. Yeah. So so there are some things. And so I think there's a tendency to think that collaboration is better face to face, whereas sometimes collaboration is better remotely. And I think it's about thinking smartly around what works individually collectively and organizationally and I think that's really complex and I think we're a long way off working that out yet yeah. because it's so personal um, I mean I, I worked I, I led European and, and global teams years ago you know over over 15 20 years ago and the only technology was the phone yeah. So we had this laborious teleconference calls because the video technology, you know, was it existed, but it was really in its yeah. infancy and it was diabolical. Yeah, you had so, to rent, you had to book the room in two weeks in advance, didn't you? And yeah. there was a special, there was a special, quite often it would be some very senior member of an organization whose PA would own the key because they didn't want everyone using that 20 grand's worth of kit there in case it got broken. And as you said, exactly. nine times out of 10, you'd go in there and whilst it worked when it worked, when it didn't work, you ended up having a conference call, didn't you? Between the two people sat in video conference centres in two different buildings. Yeah, and the, and the time lag was so terrible, it was really yeah. hard to have a conversation. So it's, you know, it's very different. But I think um, my experience of, of working via teleconferences was you could build relationships, but you had to work much harder. Yeah, and I think it, the same is true with with Zoom calls and Teams or whatever the technology is that you use with video conferencing today. You can build relationships and you can collaborate, but you actually, when you meet somebody physically face to face, you you feel their energy and you feel them in a three D form, and they're often taller or shorter and thinner yeah. or fatter or they feel different when you meet somebody face to face. And yeah. so I think there is no substitute for the face to face. And um, and also there's no substitute for the walking past somebody's desk and overhearing something and then thinking, oh, I can add to that. Yeah. Whereas yeah. when we collaborate online, we have to do it much more consciously and we have to plan it. Um, the other thing that I'm finding at the moment with uh, with teams that I'm working with is that where where working has been purely remotely for the last couple of years some of the minor disagreements have become major disagreements mm -hmm. so if you imagine you go to a you go into a meeting physically and and you know a couple of years ago you were physically face to face in a meeting and let's say you had a minor disagreement with somebody and that person just left feeling a little bit sore 
if you were in the office, you could wander past their desk later on and say, oh, Nigel, I'm sorry about that earlier. Are you OK with that? And you go, yeah, Jude, no problem. That's absolutely fine. And that would be it. It would be done. Yeah. Whereas when when you have a minor minor disagreement on Zoom and then you drop off, then you fester. And in order to resolve it, you need to either pick up the phone, which, which is much more formal than walking past somebody's desk, or you have to plan a Zoom call, which is even more formal. And therefore people don't. And so some of these minor disagreements have been ignored and brushed under the carpet, and then they build and build until then suddenly you find that you think that you disagree on everything. Whereas actually you had one, one small point that you started disagreeing on and then it blows out of proportion based on assumptions that are all just yeah. made up. Yeah. Um, I, and and there's a lot right. of that going on in teams at the moment where they have lost that social connection and they've lost that emotional connection. So whilst they're working very collaboratively and cognitively, some of the emotional connection has either not got created or has been lost to a certain extent. And I think we're now going to need, we are re-establishing that and, and pretty much all the teams that are walking through my gate at the moment. So somebody only a couple of weeks ago said to me, I need to learn how to be in the space of other people again, because I'd forgotten what it was like to really listen Course. and and because on online we tend to try and do things quicker and then get it over and done with and and yes that might seem like it's more productive but we've lost that social skill the wrap around it um the the sitting having a cup of coffee while everybody's gradually piling into the meeting room as opposed to on zoom where it's somehow just a bit more awkward as everybody's joining at different times so I think there's still a lot of social skills that we need to re-establish and, and relearn and learn in a different way. And I think we've got some, I think it'll be a long while before we actually get there. Yeah, I think it's interesting that because um, a number of things there, that sort of what the first ones that pops up to me is that uh, the disagreements and the uh, misunderstandings uh, over the virtual world. I've, over the past I'm trying to think probably, yeah, it'd be just over just over two years ago on a piece of work I was on. I had that same situation where, and it was possibly me, possibly the, the both both parties let something build. And it did build to quite a head, actually. And I, and I, it, I took a lot of grief from I personally took a lot of um, umbrage and, and uh, put me through a lot of stress. Mm. Uh, and. And it was, again, I think if we'd been in the room, it would have been a conversation as we were walking out the room or later yeah. at the coffee machine going, exactly. hang on a minute, that's not right. I don't like that. We could have gone down the coffee, gone for a walk, whatever. And and you couldn't, yeah. you didn't, it was, it didn't happen. It could have happened. Um, and and I, I think I was probably less receptive than I should have been. Um, but I think it was heightened. Uh, the, the situation was heightened anyway. There's a number of different reasons, not just because of COVID, but because of mm. it was during the beginning, right at the beginning. So it was there's a number of other things that caused it as well. But I, I just, I really echoes with me there. And it, and the other thing on that was, and I've, I'm sure I've said this on the show before. There's a, um, uh, a I don't know where I heard it uh, many years ago. There was a, a thing about um, communication. And, and the phrase, um, I never said she stole the milk. And that as a text item is to most people listening would go, well, it's obvious what that means. And I, I did an exercise the other day with my team and it was, I wrote that down. I had modified it a little bit for so it's very specific to them. Um, and if you emphasize each word in that sentence, like I never said she stole the milk suggests someone else said she stole the milk. I never said she stole the milk suggests she took it. She didn't steal it. I never said she stole it. You, you, you emphasize each of those. And the thing is, is Zoom calls have become phone calls or I am as well. Instant messaging being picked up and that. And, and I did go through this with my daughter when she first had her first mobile phone and started texting with friends to kind of go, 
what they've written there and what you're speaking in your head is completely different potentially mm. might be the same um and and learning to stop and think because those kind of conversations you can get on it's like what that's why twitter is the biggest fights club in the world because you've got a very short number of that w- words to write there very little um emotion that you can put an emphasis in there and and people misread what you mean and then you misread what they misread and just you can just go crazy and and, and i think we, and then we emotionally disconnect because yep. it's uncomfortable yeah. and and we don't like the uncertainty of a relationship that's just not solid yeah and so so it's easier often to disconnect and particularly in the online space it's easier to do that yeah Um, because we don't have the same social connection and the same emotional connection and therefore and this is why people are leaving their jobs because they haven't got that social and emotional connection to keep them to want to stay yeah and which means that you as an organization you've got to think more about how you create that inclusiveness create that sense of of well-being but also um but 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 again you've got to do that without alienating people because Mm -hmm. as as i've I've said to people before i'm I'm perfectly happy to go into a building i'm perfectly happy to drive to an office but if i'm driving to an office and going into a building i'm going to spend the day talking to people i am not going to spend the day on phone calls i will Mm. spend the day physical not not physical that would be hr scenario but you know it's it's kind of you, you stood by a whiteboard stood sat at a coffee shop looking at a screen together pointing at it actually that real as you call collaborative working mm. that you can do there and i think it's all about using the right tool for the job isn't it yeah and 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 i think that's what we've got now is you've got remote you've got face to face you've got uh, one-to-one you've got one-to-many many to one all, all all those different scenarios where it was always default of being in the office so now we have to think how am I going to make sure I build relationships with my teams so mm. I've had now two face-to-faces with my teams in in the, my team that I've got now uh, in the last uh, three th- trying to do it quarterly we're all remote we're all around the country anyway so we never would have been based in one one place but more heightened now on making sure that all of us or as many of us as we can get together in a room for a day and actually work together as a team Mm -hmm. and from day one on the first time we did it it changed the dynamic on my team it changed the relationships it created a, a a group they were very there was very much they had their own independent purposefully but they had their own independent areas of management and and what they were looking at now they're interacting with each other, advising each other, helping each other, and mm-hmm. it completely changed. No, and and that that was just physically, you could see the change from when they actually sat down in a room together and worked together. And one of the nicest things I found that day, the first day, was they were all in the room. I'd gone off to do something else, take a couple of calls while they were doing one other part of the work. I came back, I could hear them 20 yards down from the meeting room we were in, laughter coming out of that room. where the, And it was just like a sound of relationships being made and it was just yeah. brilliant. I loved it. And um, it's actually really critical for our mental and emotional well-being in the workplace and, and our sense of belonging. Yeah. Which is so critical. And I think one of the challenges for, for many project managers is, as you say, project teams, and you know, this is my certainly my experience in IBM many years ago and, and still today, is that you you form a team really quickly for a specific purpose to run a project and that project might be short or medium or long term but you have a very specific set of objectives that you need to meet as a team how you how you achieve them has to be worked out but but you have a very clear set of objectives usually and hopefully or at least you have to create those yeah and then you form really quickly and then you just have to run and you and you get off straight away so on you know, minute one, hour one of day one, there you are with the expectation of somehow we will all muddle along together and work our way through our differences of opinion. And and I think that's, you know, I think that requires huge leadership skill, huge levels of self-awareness and ability to influence in a way that many other leadership roles don't require at the same level. 
yeah because because you have that innate authority attached to a lot of the other roles don't you and that's that's where it makes yeah. it much more difficult to do I suppose that, or, you, that... or you have more stability I think if you if you're yeah. in a role that that doesn't change whereas the role of a project manager is is you know okay the role and the function of a project manager is the same but every project is different and every project team is different and therefore the relationships within the team and therefore the collective team is always going to be different so there's this continual adapting and flexing to different styles yeah i get you see what you're saying and, and i suppose that's it comes it comes to that thing where sort of uncertainty and i know that's an area that you're kind of um kind of kind of um uh, focus on with that and, and how we lead during uncertainty i can see i can my eyesight's getting worse but i'm sure that's what your book says behind you on your right yeah. shoulder um, yeah, leading through uncertainty yeah and um and i i suppose the thing is is we've got uh, a couple of years ago the, the vuca kind of phraseology that was around the, in the project management arena i'm not sure if it was in all the other management arenas you can, you can never tell because yeah. sometimes you have your own echo chamber and you think yeah. is that just my echo chamber or is that further around there it was and, it was everywhere yeah yeah and actually the timing of it was quite interesting really because through 2019 there was a lot of events and I, that's when I first heard that phrase and I went along to a PMI event in London and it, it was all based around VUCA and then suddenly it was as if someone said right look this is coming in 2020 uh let's get ready <laughs> um uh, I, I don't think we were well maybe we were maybe we weren't but but I wonder whether if we think about us as humans it, why do we find it difficult why do we find uncertainty difficult? Because I would have thought it's built in our genes, really, because we grew up on a savanna somewhere. And I know there's many years since there, but you don't know where you're going to get your food from. You don't know whether you're going to get attacked. You don't know whether X or weather and you're exposed to those sort of things. So um, living in uncertainty was is part of what we do as humans. Mm -hmm. Now, I know obviously society's created more stability now, but why do you think we still find it more why was it still difficult for us to deal with it because because un uncertainty threatens our very survival so if you as, as you talk back to caveman times um if there was uncertainty it was okay. am i going to get eaten by a tiger or a whatever or am i going to find food to eat today yeah and that actually both of those threaten your very existence and uncertainty uh, creates a threat around, am I safe? Can I, can I survive this threat? And the pandemic was a great example of that, where it yeah. was an existential crisis of uncertainty. And, and there is the existential psychologists um, have done lots of research into that and said that whenever there is uncertainty, our levels of anxiety will naturally increase. Well, that's certainly what we saw in the pandemic. And so there's this tendency to want to be, and I, and I hear this all the time every day, where people say, I, it was okay because I was in control there. But as though this idea that we're in yeah. control is actually even possible, and that it's the utopia of, if I'm in control, that means everything's okay. Well, if I'm in control, then it's okay for me but it might not be okay for you. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I think, you know, this is the old style of command and control management of the 70s and 80s, where if I'm in control, then I know everything's okay for me, but the people that work for me have to just go along with I, what I want. Well, we know, we know that that doesn't work today. Um, interestingly, when I first wrote the book, Leading Through Uncertainty, it was first published in 2018. So a long while before the pandemic yeah. but my initial idea for it was back in 2012 but every time I talked about uncertainty everybody shut me down and said no we like to be in control because there was this myth that if we're in control we're safe and yeah. then if we're in control I have a plan and if I have a plan then everything's going to be fine well project managers will tell you there's a there's a plan and then there's a reality. 
and there's the rework of the plan and the rework of it and there's the adaptation um and you know those who are used to doing agile working will certainly be familiar with with yeah. that ability to flex as well so so uns, um, uncertainty control is a myth and uncertainty has always been there but we've always felt that we're safer if we have control and and you see parents do this with their children where if they think that they tell their children what to do and their children do what they're told then their kids are safe well, physically they might be, but emotionally they're not because they're not learning the skills of risk management in their own yeah. lives and, and so on. So uncertainty is healthy as long as we have the skills to navigate it. And I think that's the challenge because we've had this innate desire to be safe and have control and certainty. And therefore, whenever there is uncertainty, all sorts of things like ha happen. So our anxiety increases we have a natural fear response because suddenly our safety is threatened. So whenever there's uncertainty, there is anxiety, there is fear. There's also polarization. So if you look at um, the pandemic as a great example or, or Brexit or, or any of the situations where there's uncertainty, you can guarantee that people will have polarized opinions. And that's because if you look at something like um, the pandemic, We've never led, nobody on the planet has ever led through a global pandemic in a year where we have the technology to work remotely, globally. We've never done that before. And everybody on the planet pretty much had an opinion about how it should be done. Yeah. And, and so what happens is we have opinions that are based on our values, our beliefs, our assumptions, our experience, but they're not fact because it will be probably decades before we get the facts of what was the best way to run a pandemic. And we may never have the answer because everybody did it differently. Every country did it differently. And we didn't collaborate globally. We actually went to more an individualistic approach, which again is what often happens in uncertainty is we move away from collaboration because it's difficult because we shut down differences of opinion and so we start to hang on to our own opinion. And it doesn't matter whether you thought, you know, vaccines were great or you thought vaccines were bad. Nobody was ever going to change your mind by sitting down in the pub telling you you were wrong. And, and the same with Brexit. Nobody ever changed anybody else's mind in the pub saying you should have voted remain or you should have voted leave. And yet that's what we try and do. And this is where we create this polarization because we come from this place of, I must be right, which means you must be wrong. And you think the same thing. So this is where we get this clash or we get a disconnect. And, and therefore you're not getting that emotional connection and we're not working through our differences of opinion. And therefore we're shutting down difference and we're shutting down diversity and we create much more polarization. And we're certainly seeing that in the world today. Yeah. where it becomes much more vociferous and social media fuels that, of course. It's interesting because, um, and I'm reflecting on my own behaviours through these things, uh, and my, I, I'm, I'll, I'll admit, I'm not a big news uh, consumer. I, I have, I've avoided the news, the, the regular news media for 20 years, really. Uh, and during the pandemic, I probably watched more news than I have in the 15 years before 20 years before that and uh, I found myself and I've started uh, when I reflect that, that I have kind of shut down on uh, opinions in or stopped following or removed certain things from my and I mentioned echo chamber earlier move, remove things from mine which which because I didn't, some of it is a case of I just don't agree with some people's points of view. I don't want to have an argument. I don't want to have a conversation with them. Therefore, I've removed them from my, because it's not feeding my mental health. It's not feeding my happiness in life. Mm. But the but the the sacrifice that I make there is somebody else's opinion and me being able to understand someone else's point of view. Yeah. Uh, and but it's 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 a really difficult balance to do it because again it's kind of like you'll see a post from certain people that make you absolutely furious and and but but stop myself getting involved with it 
but it still makes me furious and, and flabbergasted at why someone would say something. Yeah. But then then it's kind of, do I need to look at and try and understand why they might say that and where the information they're getting and the point of view of their own personal situation. And it's all, as you say, it's all, we all do things um, and we behave, whether it be in the, those big things or in the small thing based on our own uh, current situation. And the things that you, I would do in someone else's situation I may do the same thing and make the same decision as them or say the same thing as them if I were in their shoes. Yeah. Whereas I can only see it from my shoes. It's really, it's hard to balance it. And then when you start looking at stakeholders in your business and stakeholders in the project, people on your team, looking at it, it's easy. And I've done it myself to knee jerk and think dickhead um, about someone. Why are you being like that? And then when I step back and think about it, I think, well, no, you don't know what they're doing at the moment. You don't know what's going on in their team. You don't know what's going on with their manager. Um, yeah. And, but it's still, it's, I still, but I can't stop myself thinking that way because I think that's, that's the way my brain will work at times. And it's really difficult because sometimes you feel guilty about feeling that way. And I suppose the, the, the other thing on, on what you're saying there was around the agile stuff, because agile popped in my head around the uncertainty because it is, the latest buzzword, the latest thing with with everything around there, and it 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 introduces uncertainty in a kind of formalized manner. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you, as a project manager, as you say, you can put your project plan together, you know your dev team are going to finish that piece of work in twenty days because they told you they needed nineteen days, and you added one extra, and so you know they're going to do that work, um, and and you know that the the uh, test is going to be able to do it and you put in several iterations of testing so you've got you know they're going to sort that all out and these guys and you know it because it's on your plan as you said and you can go through that and you've got that i think what it is is you understand even if so if the dev takes longer to develop you understand why Mm -hmm. in the agile environment you haven't necessarily got those um big markets to put down and go that's our aim or objective because it can be that you haven't got that aim or objective for quite some time and it can be that fail fast do it iterate it through and that's where i think a lot of our and i certainly i find it um i love the, the agile methodologies i love the ideas and the concepts of them the actual practical application as a project manager or program manager portfolio manager when someone asks you well when's it going to be finished it kind of, it kind of draws two little things together and, and 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 they clash with those conversations and it's quite i find it quite challenging to do that because i've got no control i can't tell someone oh i know by definite it's going to be then all i can say is well i know that we'll have a release of something at that point and then a release at that point and it's it's quite absolutely um, and then of course you've got different stakeholders who have different perspectives who yeah. all want different things and yeah. that often is surprising but I don't know why it's surprising because of course they have different things yeah. you know the sales director is always going to want something different from the ops director yeah. because they're yeah. incented in different ways and therefore their requirements are always going to be different and actually that's a positive thing because what that does is it creates a more well-rounded and more holistic view. Yeah. I think this is where, as as project managers and as, as leaders, we need to be able to develop those skills of uncertainty and the skills to be able to say, okay, so if you want that, tell me why you want that and be really curious. Because what we tend to do is we make judgments really quickly. And of course, in uncertainty, those judgments are based on very little foundation. Yeah. So... And, and then what we tend to do is we make a judgment about what we think is true based on a set of assumptions that may not even be documented or well thought through. And then we look for evidence that proves our point because we don't like to be wrong. So we look for that evidence and then, and we do this on social media as well, and we discard yeah. anything else that disagrees with it. And if you look at you know most science, you could argue most things and you'll find scientists that could argue either way on virtually any topic um and so even with even with scientific research it's it's rarely binary yeah 
the scientific on, research is based on that whole thing is based on proving something doesn't work isn't it yeah yeah proving or, or based on proving that something does work within a set of circumstances yeah. and so and i think one of the things that we can easily overlook here is that as human beings we're much more complex we're not binary yeah um, and and actually project plans we like to think you know here's 120 lines or it's going to take 120 days and plus x for contingency or whatever it is if we've got a plan and we can follow that perfectly then that's the job done we have to take into account the fact that we're human beings and that we have an emotional response to change that we have an emotional response to uncertainty that we have an emotional response to the new person joining the team who we may or may not like for whatever reason, because we might not be a good values fit or we might not just instantly click. So the human, human side of how we influence each other is nearly always overlooked in a project plan. Yeah. But it's fundamentally at the core of the ability of a project manager to succeed. It kind of, it's, it's funny something just pops in there. It's kind of, um, when you look at stakeholders, from what you said before on that, it's just made me think. Sometimes if you look at a project and you're as a project manager, you're there delivering your project and you've gone around all your stakeholders and they're all in vigorous agreement on what the outcomes are meant to be. And they all have different areas that it come from. There's a very good chance that you've got it wrong what do you mean it's the, if you've had that conversation to say there's six senior stakeholders and all of them absolutely are on board mm. i it's kind of a red flag in some ways because those human elements that that you talk about there and their different perspectives mm. would make something it might only be mine but something that they would say but yeah that's yeah fine that's the nice direction but we need this bit as well or this bit's more important than me. And if they're all saying the same thing, there's a good chance you've missed or you're asking the wrong question yeah. and it's too high well, level. And then you get down into the detail and then all hell breaks loose because the co conflicts start. Or and you've got a group, of di a group of directors or stakeholders who are not diverse and therefore they don't have yeah. a well-rounded yeah. view of the world. They may have a particular view of the world that yeah. doesn't represent the population or the customer base or the user base yeah yeah because and, and, or they're all the same kind of uh, behavior type or character type and uh, because we all like working with people like us because they all kind of it, it's that scenario that i think it's funny actually it just makes me think about the yes man yes man yes woman scenario where you have someone and they've got a load of people who completely would agree with them and and it's always presented as a yeah they're just people who are, are deferential to the person in charge but it does also make you wonder whether it's just that right i have these kind of ideas i'm this kind of person and they bring in and attract people who are like them so therefore they will agree with them because they think in the same manner they willing to take the same kind of risks they're willing to take or not take the risk whatever and you get that kind of um uh that again it's, it's about echo chamber kind of thing isn't it it's all about bringing the same thing and you you've without that diversity of of uh diversity with a big d and diversity with a little d um you don't get that um sometimes you just don't get that right answer do you no and i think the the the, the thing here is it it's difficult to work through our differences of opinion yeah. Yeah. it's so easy to agree and it makes it means that i can i can do things i might think that i can do things faster if my team around me agree with everything i say because actually it's time consuming to stop yeah. and have a debate yeah. if everyone did everything so, like me life would be much better wouldn't it exactly <laughs> and I, but i think this is this is where we have to learn to slow down sometimes and to yeah. recognize yeah. that fast isn't always best and and actually fast is sometimes slower in the longer term because yeah. you might think you've you, you've you've achieved something really quickly but is it actually fit for what you're trying to do? And is it fit for and relevant for your audience? And and yeah. does it move the organization forward? Or yeah. does it improve technology or whatever, you know, whatever kind of project you're running? And and so of course we all want 
people around us who say, oh, yes, Jude, yes, Jude, yes, Jude, because that makes my life easier. But in reality, it, it doesn't longer term. And, and if somebody's going to call me out and say, hang on a minute, Jude, I don't think that's the right thing to do. I need to have the skills to be able to be curious instead of irritated. Yeah. Because yeah, and I, that's a really good point, yeah. Because instantly I want to shut that opinion down Yeah. because yeah. I've got a thousand and one things on my to-do list to do and haven't got time for a debate. And so you can see how levels of frustration and irritation can grow when people say no or when they bring a different point of view. But actually those debates, we need to start seeing them as useful and healthy and helpful so that we consider things from different perspectives because in the longer term that actually speeds us up that, what it also means is that if i know i've got someone on, on my team who's going to call me out and say hang on jude i think you're heading down the wrong route i can i can actually go faster if i've got one of those people in my team yeah because yeah. i can start to trust that if I'm heading off in the wrong direction, somebody's going to call me out. And, I, and actually, I tend to build teams in that way with people who are going to call me out on stuff, because that yeah. way I know that I can go headlong and I am someone that works at 300 miles an hour and I can go off really fast, knowing that someone's going to go, hang on, Jude, either too fast or wrong direction. And I then have to go, OK, stop. What are you seeing that I'm not seeing? And yeah. be really yeah. curious, even though I don't like it, <laughs> even yeah. though I might want to be irritated and frustrated, we need to manage our emotional state and really replace it with curiosity. I think yeah. curiosity is a really underrated skill in our leadership, no matter what your job role is. I think it's and, and I think the thing is, is it's a weird one, but as a society, and I've got 10 year old and a 15 year old kids have had curiosity maybe less so now but it gets a little bit knocked out of you doesn't it it's kind of yeah stop stop asking why and i was on another conversation the other day and we were talking about the fact that why such a powerful powerful word when trying to understand what other people are doing or asking for or want and and it's using it over and over and over again to get there and i think i, I just uh, that that whole thing where you say, I love that phrase that you use there when someone, to, I've even written it, writ it down. Um, when someone disagrees um, with you, that you should become curious, not irritated. I think that's a fantastic way that you put that across because I, I do that myself. And um, I know there are, I can, I can get frustrated with just make the decision. Just do that. We'll do that. It's dead easy. Surely. I can see it a mile away and it when when it's not there and there's someone diving down into more detail because I'm not they're more detail orientated than me in this particular instance I can sit there getting frustrated and annoyed instead of as you say sit back and go why are they concerned should I be why what why why are they asking that question what is it from their point of view it's unlikely to be that they're stupid. It's more likely to be that they have something, a different lens or something I've missed. And I've had I've had people working with me in teams, I've mentioned them before, who I are kind of opposite to me in their style and, and the way that they think things and were able to kind of tamp, like you were saying, just um, hold me back a little bit. They'd be my conscience when I was charging off in the wrong direction or with it with too quickly or whatever as you say. And I think that finding people like that who you can build such a strong relationship with that they can grab you by the head and say, stop it, you're doing the wrong thing without mm. and, and you would feel uncomfortable, but you know that they're doing it with love in their heart to save you and them from getting somewhere. And I, I heard a story about the Wright brothers that there was some situation and they were having a screaming argument at each other and someone said well how can you do that how can you work together like that and i said well that we that's making sure we, we weren't having an we weren't there was nothing at the end of it it was how they discussed a problem that they had 
because one of them vehemently disagreed with what the, the other one was doing and they were absolutely comfortable with telling them what they were doing wrong mm. and they would argue about it and then they go right okay there's the decision but they were they were firm and and to others it might have seemed like an argument but it was a firm conversation and I've, I've had people I've worked with where we've kind of stood up <laughs> kind of toe to toe um and they were telling me I was wrong and they told me I was wrong and they had a go at me was wrong and they, we had fruity language when we were doing it and and they spoke to me later and apologized and I said don't worry about it you, I know the reason you do it and actually you were right you were trying to make the point of me and you cared about it and you were right so I, I and and yeah, that person a brilliant person to have on my team yeah and I think the interesting thing here as well is that the, the dynamics of relationships are complex because in, with some people, it's possible to have that really healthy debate where neither person takes it personally and it looks like a real ding dong. Yeah. But because nobody's taking it personally, what it actually creates is some energy and it fuels passion yeah. and creativity and some really good positive stuff can come out of it for those two people if it works for those two people yeah yeah but if there um, are other people around you that are unnerved by that then we also have to think about well, what's the impact that we're having of that so I have um somebody that I work with on a regular basis in in my business and he and I have some real humdingers of debates of and and we can get really heated because we're both passionate about it and we often take the opposite point of view and at the end of it, we always come to some consensus. We always come to a decision that is rarely my decision or his. It's usually a combination of the two. And it's usually something that's vastly different from what we would have come up with individually. Yeah. And because we don't take it personally, we can have that really healthy debate. But we can't have it with, with a wider team around us. Because actually, it find that particularly some of the younger members of my team, will find that more unnerving yeah and so that's a debate that he and I would have when there's just the two of us and we're always needing to think about what's the impact that I'm having and what's the impact that I'm wanting to have so that I'm engaging people and making them feel comfortable around me recognizing that uncertainty is already creating discomfort so our job as leaders is to also create comfort as much as we possibly can to keep people with us and you know going back to where where we started around employee turnover if we can't make people feel comfortable and safe even in the midst of great uncertainty they will leave yeah and it's and actually it's not because they're not talented and it's not because we're not talented it's just that the impact has just not been a good fit yeah. So continually need to look at, am I, am I getting the impact that I want to have? And this is one of the things that, you know, I find working with the horses all of the time. The, the moment somebody walks through my gate, they have an impact on the horses. So as a team walk through the gate, the horses, if the team are exhausted and on their knees, which I've had quite a lot recently, um, the horses will all lie down. If the team oh, wow. are really stressed and there's huge amounts of energy and banter, the horses will gallop around. So the horses instantly are responding based on that team's impact. And usually that team have no idea that they have that impact. And so one of the things I think we need to really focus on is, is that self-awareness. And if you ask any leader, they'll tell you they're self-aware. In fact, usually the ones who tell me they're self-aware are the ones who are least self-aware. <laughs> because, because we all have a level of self-awareness, but we also all have our blind spots. Yeah, and, and that's the point. Of, yeah. Yeah. And so part of, part of working with the horses is to uncover the blind spots because they're very good at pushing those buttons and, and revealing that. Yeah. But part of our role as leaders is to continually be curious about Oh, there's there's a disagreement here. Well, there's a disconnect here. What does this person want from me? Because what we tend to do is say, this is what I want from that person. And I think we need to keep flipping that on its head and saying, what does this person want and need from me as a leader in order to feel safe to engage, in order to have that conversation that enables us to collaborate in a way that works for me and for them? 
So we're continually having to adapt our own behavior to, to fit with others so that we can, and to do that in an authentic way. So it's not about me trying to be like you to fit in with you or trying to be like somebody else who's quieter or louder. It's, it's about saying, how do I match the energy and bring people with me and continually look at the impact that I'm having and continually look to change it so that I get the impact that I'm wanting to have, which doesn't necessarily mean I get the result I want, or it doesn't mean it always goes my way. Yeah. But the impact being we achieve the project, not necessarily my way, but we achieve it or we, or we achieve it where the relationships are intact at the end of it, hopefully. Yeah, it's, it just, it just uh, I, I always draw parallels in every single conversation I've ever had, I think, on this show around um, the DISC model. And I'm sure you've heard of the, the DISC model, uh, the behavioral model. And that that thing of where people like that, that where you get people who are comfortable having those big arguments and then you get people at the other end who are the team leaders who would uh, who are the sort of like the high the high s's who really really would struggle with that kind of full-on banter of the high d's that get <laughs> five minutes later they're best mates outside playing golf or whatever or, or um doing whatever because that's what happens is it's a big argument it's dropped and then they're best mates again and um i i find that it's i have to think about it uh my and i don't do it enough is about my behavior and how i influence other people um i still think think of myself as the newbie as the i'm still that 20 year old who was doing stuff there and i think that's part of the problem as well you don't sometimes we don't see ourselves as those um such an influence you still kind of that lack of confidence in there and um and and therefore that 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 stops you realizing how much impact you can have in just your behavior on the whole team yeah. um because you don't uh, some people do maybe 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 it's just me maybe others don't but i for me i don't see myself as um i want to use the word i was going to use the role, word role model but that's not the word i'm thinking of but it's kind of that that kind of thing where people will mimic not mimic, but will react to my behavior uh, in in different ways. Um, mm. Whereas I think I'm just a, a side character, if you like, in a in a novel rather than uh, my novel sort of thing. And, and, and I think yeah. you know, if you go back to what project managers do, what we tend to think that project managers do is we think that they have a vision, they set the objectives, they build a plan, and then they execute the plan. Well, all of that's very transactional. And what yeah. actually project managers really do is build relationships yeah. and influence other people to do stuff that hopefully then executes the plan. Yeah. And I think sometimes it's easy to miss that that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. That what we're trying to do is lead and engage and inspire others to execute because the project manager can't execute the whole plan. Yeah. But they can lead and inspire and encourage others to, to collaboratively create that vision and to be passionate about it and to be excited about it and want to get up in the morning and go, great, it's Monday. Yeah. And I think it, it does, when you look at it now in the way that the word management is used um, in comparison to leadership and you see lots of the memes where you'll have, this is a manager, this is a leader. And actually, that's where a lot of the um, uh, misunderstanding of what a PM's job is. The PM's job isn't to follow a process. PM's mm -hmm. job isn't to make sure the play. You know, I mean, there's all those tools and techniques you've got um, that process, PM box, the um, APM prints, all that stuff. None of those things are any use for delivering projects. Mm -hmm. it, don't care what anyone says, I'll argue with them. The people deliver the projects. Yeah. <laughs> and the, it, the, the squishy things deliver projects. Mm -hmm. They use those techniques and tools to do them, but it's the squishy things. And the squishy things get things done through relationships, and relationships are built through communication and interaction between us. And that's, uh, that's, and, and if you're going to 
if you're going to lead, as you say, it's about project leadership and project leaders. Mm. I, I've seen, unfortunately, I've seen it before, a project lead as seeing as a, a subservient role to a project manager because it's seen as a, a more sub project manager I've seen in some places. And it's kind of like, actually, we're project leaders. We don't manage a project. We lead a project, as you say. And it's about taking people with you, taking your sponsors with you, take your team with you, take your suppliers with you, take your consumers with you and lead them to the to the conclusion of this project. You don't manage them. You don't corral, you don't corral them into it. You're actually just going, come on, let's go. And it's kind of mm. goes there. Um, mm. I'm just noticing now we're coming up on an hour of recording now. And we haven't really talked about the horses much. <laughs> it's kind of, it's just how these things go anyway. But I kind of, do you want to, I, I'm, I'm intrigued and understand. I'm, I'm fascinated by the thought of, of, of what, just talk to us about if someone was coming along and, and um, working with you and working with your horses, what would what would they expect? Or is it all secret? And a big oh, surprise. No, it's not a big, well, it's not a secret <laughs> at all. I mean, I, I share regularly on on LinkedIn examples of of um, people working with the horses, and um, the horses respond based on your nonverbal behaviour and communication. And usually, when I say that, people sit up straight because they think it's their body language, but actually, yeah. it's so much more. Yeah, it's so much more than that. It's what you're thinking, what you're feeling, your energy, your emotions, your intentions. Um, it's almost as if they're mind readers, of course they're not, but energetically, we, we change our energy um, different according to different scenarios and circumstances. And so the horses respond based on that. And what they're looking for is three things, clear direction, what are you asking me to do? Strong relationship based on trust and respect and free will to choose whether they engage or not. And if you bring all three of those things, the horses will engage and come with you. And if you don't, they plant their feet and refuse to engage, which is pretty much what happens in the workplace as well. Because if you yeah. think about the best leaders that we want to be with, they're ones who are really clear what they want us to do. And they, we have trust and respect and a good relationship. And we feel like we have free will rather than being dragged or coerced or forced into doing something. Yeah. And, um, and so what the horses will do is engage and come with you willingly or they plant their feet and refuse to engage. The other reason why they might refuse to engage is if your behavior is not congruent. So if you're thinking this horse doesn't want to move, but then you go up to the horse and say, come with me, there's a mismatch between what you're thinking and feeling versus what you're asking. And they sense that. And if you think about that as, as humans, we do too. So if you, if you ever meet somebody and you shake their hand and you think, oh, there's something about this person that's just not quite, yeah. I can't put my finger on what it is, but we have that sense of, you know, is there something about that person that just doesn't gel? Probably their behavior is not congruent. They're probably hiding behind a mask and not being honest or transparent. And therefore we can't build a relationship with them. Um, and so we'll tend to avoid those people and, and, and we'll try and do it in a polite way. The horses aren't polite. They'll just plant their feet and refuse to engage. <laughs> and so it's the, it's the most revealing feedback you'll ever have, both about where are you strong as a leader? So, you know, where, when you bring confidence and courage and clarity and relationship, they'll come really willingly. And that's really empowering to know that 800 kilograms of sentient being with a, with a strong opinion is coming with you. And then if they're if they're not if they're not engaged or they're not inspired by you, they just won't come. And if you try and use force, particularly with my mayor Callie, she'll headbutt you. <laughs> so she won't be forced, she won't be coerced. And many have tried, believe me. So when people take a shorter lead rope or they try and yank her, she'll headbutt them and say, not that. And of course, we can all think of somebody in the office that we'd like to quite like to headbutt or see headbutted by a horse. But and, and, and maybe I've got a list. Have, yeah. And maybe some of your listeners are the ones who, you know, will need the headbutt by the horse. And I, you know, goodness knows, I think I've been headbutted a few times by the horses. So, you know, we're, we're, we're all capable of bringing things that other people are saying, no, not that. Yeah. Um, and the difference is people will go along with it for a period of time because we think we should. 
and the horses won't. So it is the clearest feedback you'll ever get, but it's the clearest feedback without an agenda, other than, are you safe to follow as a leader? Are you someone that makes me feel like I want to come? Am I, am I compelled to come with you? And, and so it, it has no agenda other than that. Whereas when we give people feedback at the, in the office, if you think about the aggressive person in the team, everybody wants the aggressive person to be less aggressive. Yeah. Well, yeah. firstly, the aggressive person doesn't think they're aggressive. Secondly, they don't know any other way. And they think that you should behave in a different way, not them. And so we hit this impasse where nobody changes their behavior. Whereas when a horse is aggressive with me, my first thought is, what do they want from me that I'm not giving them? So when I took on a horse years ago, who pinned me against the fence and, and snapped at me with his teeth, never bit me, but snapped at me. My first thought was, yikes, what does he need from me that I'm not giving? I'm not creating a scenario where he feels safe. Therefore, I need to do something different. And I completely changed my behavior. And as a result, he's a completely different horse. And so I think we need to do more of that in the workplace. And that's why, that's why I work with the horses because individually you get to see one-on-one -on -one what are you like with the horse. When you start to then work as a team with a horse, you get to see all the default patterns of behavior that show up in a team. So, you know, who's the, who's the joker that gets distracted? and wanders off. Well, as soon as that joker wanders off or gets distracted, that's what happens with the horse too. Yeah. Or where is the communication not effective enough? So the person who's leading from the front is not being given feedback from behind, from the wider team. And therefore they keep turning around and getting involved in the detail because nobody's telling them to back off or nobody's giving them feedback and saying, don't worry, here's a problem that we're dealing with, but we've got it. We don't need you to get involved. So a lot around how do you empower people? How do you get people to step out of the detail? Pretty much all of the things that we grapple and struggle with in our leadership of, of each other in the workplace, all of those things show up around the horses. And, and so we reveal them so they become much more conscious and we start to look at, so how does the aggressive person who gets headbutted by a horse what else have they got that is not is not aggression? And usually what you find is that if we flex our style, the horses will then engage. And so people quickly learn how to change their behavior. Because I think that's something we don't know how to change behavior quickly. And so we don't change it. We stay with the same old patterns of behavior. Yeah. Working with the horses, people learn, if I recalibrate or I just shift my behavior or my attention slightly, it can have a dramatic impact. And to then realize that whenever, so, so now, for example, whenever something's not working or a relationship is just not quite in flow, my first response is, what do they need from me? And to change my behavior, because if I want to change somebody else's behavior, I have to change my own. Yeah, that's the powerful thing, isn't it? Um, it, if you that as you said about forcing someone to do something forcing them to be different uh and, and and i think a lot of us sit back and go well it's i'm i'm me it's I, I can't just change who i am i wouldn't be me and and whilst that is true it's not about changing who you are it's about recognizing where the way that you are naturally rubs up against someone else and and I always talk about the, the the disc ice cream view of talk about if you if you're with your child and they step out into the road, you immediately turn into someone who's very forced, very authoritative, and very shouting. You shout at that person to get back on there, and you grab them and you launch them onto the the road. They start crying. At that point, you drop down to your knees, you give them a hug, you soothe them, you be that nurturing kind of much more. Um, nurturing character then you say right okay should we should we go and have some fun let's go and have an ice cream you become more fun that more uplifting person who kind of let's go and do something and then quietly when you're sat there you slowly explain to them the reason why you shouted and what might have happened had they done it and why they need to concentrate but actually 
all of those three behaviors are very, very different styles of leadership yeah. that you in a matter of seconds and minutes have gone one to the other to the third. You know, you go bang, 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 bang without even thinking about it. You just do it. So as a as a person, we can change our behavior at a drop of a hat, depending Absolutely. on the situation. But when we're working and we're in an environment that's just a, maybe a less intense environment, um, we we have to slow ourselves down, as you said earlier, so that we can speed up. If you slow yourself down and think, hang on, the question you said there, wh- why are they why are they like that? Why is this happening? So that you can then modify, but otherwise we just charge on, don't we? I think it's mm-hmm. really, really, really key to think about what does this person need from me at this point in time mm-hmm. brilliant yeah. well jude i thank you very much for um some fantastic uh conversation there some fascinating stuff with the horses there i'm going to continue that conversation with you um uh, uh outside of here and i'm uh, it's uh yeah the whole thing is just it's just got lots of things pinging around in my head um if uh, people want to get in touch with you, if they want to come along and, and experience the, the learning how to uh, uh, improve their leadership, the horses or grab hold of one of your books, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Um, probably my website, judejennison.com. So you can find links to my books on there. You can find out about me, you can find out about my work with the horses um, or on LinkedIn, um, connect with me on LinkedIn, Jude Jennison. Um, okay. It's, the, the best thing about my name is it's unusual enough that you can find me easily on LinkedIn and, and pretty much on any social media platform. Yeah, I, I, I have the same sort of thing. It's quite useful, isn't it? Um, well, it, it's brilliant. So what I'll do, I'll put links in the um, show notes to both of those anyway, so people can get hold of you. So all it leads me to say is thank you very much for giving me so much time um, and uh, imparting so much knowledge and uh, information there. Um, it's been a brilliant uh, conversation and uh, have a fantastic rest of your evening. Thank you very much, Nigel. Thanks for having me. Cheers.